So, does anyone know what the tomb of the unknown soldier is? Anybody? No, so the tomb of the unknown soldier is a tomb in the Arlington National Cemetery, which is in Washington, D.C. And this tomb is a memorial for all the soldiers who have died uh, in the wars of the United States, um, whose remains and bodies were never recognized. Um, they couldn't identify them. And so there's been thousands of soldiers who have been lost at war, but they never found their body. And so that's what this tomb recognizes. Um, but I would say that this tomb is it's pretty famous, but I would say it's even more famous because of the soldiers who guard it. So at this tomb, there is a 24-7, every single day of the year, army guard that watches over this tomb. Um, sometimes they have um, guests come. I've actually been there. I've got to see what they call the changing of the guard every 30 minutes where a new army soldier will come in ceremoniously and watch the tomb and he'll just sit there for 30 minutes. And these soldiers, the various soldiers over the years have been watching this tomb night and day since 1948. Mm. And I, I can't do the math in my head, but that's at least 60 years, I think. Um, it's a long time. Um, I mean, night and day, you know, cold, it gets cold up there, it gets hot up in DC. And they, these soldiers give their lives to this service to commoderate um, their fallen comrades. Mm -hmm. And could you just imagine just the service that these soldiers give to their fallen brothers and sisters? I think this, the lives of these soldiers um, greatly picture how God wants us to live our lives for him, a life of service. And so the passage we're reading today is from Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. And the Apostle Paul uses the, this short section as a transition between gospel truth and gospel command. So in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, Paul goes into this deep dive into glorious theology and about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and how man can be saved in his sin. 11 chapters. And then following this short section, chapters 12 to 16, Paul gives the Christians in Rome a whole bunch of commands to follow, to be patient, to love your neighbor, to care for your Christian brother and sister. And so these two verses transition from these two major categories, from the indicative to the imperative. And that's where we find ourselves today. So let's go ahead and read it. It's uh, on your bulletin right here. In big letters. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the main idea of this text is because of God's grace, we must dedicate our entire life to him. Because of God's grace, we must dedicate our entire life to him. And there are two points to this sermon. The first is the command of the gospel and the second point is the fruit of the gospel. So let's go ahead and look at the command of the gospel. So this passage is kind of like a soda being poured into a glass. There's all these big spiritual words just bubbling up and just spilling out everywhere. And it seems like it could be a little confusing um, with all the words Paul uses here. But if we just take a second to look at it, I think um, if we look at it together, we'll be able to understand it a little bit better. So Paul immediately says, I appeal to you. But this word appeal, um, actually, I don't think it's strong enough. Uh, the new, uh, the NIV translation of the Bible actually translates this word as urge. And I think urge really strengthens what he's about to say. 
that these commands that he's about to give. So he says, I urge you, brothers. And then he says, therefore. And now, already we have to stop and just look at this word therefore and really figure out what it means and define it. So a great question to ask when you see the word therefore in scripture is to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? <laughs> What's the therefore, therefore? So as I said earlier, Paul has just taken 11 chapters to dive into the gospel of Jesus Christ and how he died for our sin and how we can be saved. And this is critical, critical to understand what he's about to say to us, the appeal that he's about to make. We must understand the grace of God in our lives before we obey his commands. You can't obey God unless you have been saved by his grace. You can't please God unless you have put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. And God, he doesn't want you to obey before you put your faith in Christ. To try and obey God without believing in Jesus just leads to works-based salvation, trusting in yourself, in your ability to follow these commands. We can't do these commands that Paul is going to give us to think that they're going to save us. We must be saved by the gospel of Jesus before we obey him, before we try to live for God. So just remember that. Remember the grace that the Lord has given you as we move to these gospel commands. And that Paul even further just clarifies this as he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God really just kind of encapsulates everything that was said in chapter 11. So he kind of like goes at it twice to remember that we can't follow this appeal without the mercy of God. We need the mercy of God in our life. So with all that in mind, Paul sees that there is only one way to live in response to God's mercy. And that is to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, this might seem like a hard thing to do. I mean, could you imagine us Americans living in the most luxurious and probably richest nations to ever exist in the life of comfort that we, we fortunately, we get to have? Praise the Lord for that. But it might seem hard that we could somehow live a life of sacrifice to God amidst the current context that we live in. But once we orient our, our minds to what Paul is saying here, I think you'll be encouraged and empowered to live your life for God. So this past week, I went to two weddings, two weddings in one week. I mean, does that make any of, any of you guys sound tired? <laughs> yeah, I'm a little exhausted from that. Um, but as I was preparing for this sermon in the midst of going to these two weddings, I noticed something different that I hadn't really picked up on, um, at least in this, in this context, while I was listening to the, the wedding ceremony. There is a lot of exhortation and commands given to the bride and groom during the wedding ceremony. I mean, over and over again. And there, there's nothing like marriage that illustrates a life of service and sacrifice for somebody else. In the ceremony, the groom is constantly exhorted to sacrifice for his wife, to make her needs his, and to live relentlessly for his wife. The groom, he's being given a gift from God. His wife is a gift from God, a companion to live with for the rest of their days. But this gift, it's not just for the groom. It's not for his own pleasure, his own needs. No, God has given him this gift to live in service to his wife and then to God as well. And I think this is how Paul sees our Christian life. We have been given a gift of grace, that we have been saved from sin. And now we ought to live our lives for God, for the one who gave us this gift. So when Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, your body, he doesn't mean present just your physical body like 
like here's my arm, like take my arm, you know, cut it off. Now he, when he says this, he's asking you to give your entire life, your body and your soul to God. And in the Old Testament, um, we actually see the sacrificial language uh, in this verse. And so in the Old Testament, God, he called his people to uh, bring living animal sacrifices to pay for their transgressions and sins. So the people, they would come and bring their animal and they would shed the blood of the animal so that God wouldn't punish them for their transgressions against them and so that God could dwell with his people. And those, those uh, sacrifices are just a picture of what God was going to do in the future for all sin. They were just a picture of how he was going to pay for sin permanently. So Christians, our Savior, Jesus Christ, became our living sacrifice for our sin. So when we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, Jesus, he was the one that went on the altar and died for us. Now, because of his death, because of his resurrection, we get to live. We get to live for him. Paul actually talks about this in, in Romans 6, 4, just a few chapters back. He says, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we t- by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Jesus, he was our living sacrifice, so that we can now live our lives in submission and obedience to him. We can't live and please God without his transforming work in our lives. And that's what it means for us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. To live for God in light of what Christ has done for us. Is this how you view your life? Do you see every moment as an opportunity to serve Jesus and to glorify God? I'm sure you guys spend a lot of time together. Uh, y'all play. I know y'all play a lot of games. Susan sets up a lot of games for you guys. Bingo, I hear, is a favorite around here. Um, I, y'all probably eat dinner together a lot. Um, do y'all see that as a time to encourage one another, to encourage a brother or a sister here that lives with you? I want y'all to see that your time here in this wonderful home can be a, a time for you to serve God. And that you can live your life for him here. And he, he has called you to be in this place. God has ordained you to be here. And there is ample opportunity for you to make a difference for Jesus here in this building. So our second point is the fruit of the gospel. And this second verse here just further explains the idea presented in the first verse. Uh, The second verse just gives us a clear example of how to present our lives for Christ. And it kind of just gets specific on how how do we do this in a fallen world. And then after that, he gives just one of the fruits, um, the outcomes of what it might look like for you to live your life for God. So does anyone here know the term metamorphosis? You might remember it from your school days. Um, and then maybe forgot it after that. That's what I did. But it's a science term we all learned uh, in school. But according to the internet, metamorphosis means a change of the form or nature of a thing or person into a completely different one by natural or supernatural means. I think the most common example of metamorphosis are frogs. So frogs, they go through metamorphosis and a frog, it starts out, you know, as a little frog egg, and then the, the egg hatches, and then now the frog turns into a tadpole. You might remember a tadpole, and they're like just little fish, and they just kind of swim around. And as they go through this, this metamorphosis, this stages of their life, they grow into something bigger. So the tadpole then becomes a tadpole with legs. So now it's like a little fishy with like little legs flying, you know, back behind them. And then, I don't know how it works, but somehow this tadpole with leg turns into like a frog, like a big old frog. And that's its adult life cycle. That's the stage that it finally reaches. 
I think, I mean, this is a fascinating cre uh, part of God's creation. Um, to see a frog go through metamorphosis to change from one stage to the next. Why, why am I talking about frogs? Well, in this verse, one of uh, the words that Paul uses um, actually is what the word metamorphosis comes from. Uh, you see the word be transformed. So the Greek word for be transformed is metamorpho. Now you might, do you hear it in there? Metamor metamorph, metamorph. You see, Paul, he sees the Christian life similar to the stages of a frog's life cycle. Now, obviously, we're not changing from tadpoles into frogs. And, and even as humans, you know, we're not going from one stage to like another life cycle. But by God's grace, God, he continually transform us. He transform us to look more like Christ as our lives go on and as we become more like Jesus. And so just want you to, to think about um, that meta, uh, metaphor um, as we talk about the transformation of the gospel. And so the Lord, he wants us to take part in that change. He wants us to be a part of this transformation that he has given us. And Paul says at the beginning of verse 2, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed. And by world, Paul means the sinful patterns of those that live around us uh, in this broken world that we live in. So have you ever conformed to the world? Have you ever, or do you ever give into the pressures of those around you? Maybe to be, to be mean to somebody in this home who might get on your nerves, um, or maybe I know our society is all about the self. It's about individualism. Do you ever take part in that? Do you value your life above others here? Even in this um, stage of life, friends, the world wants you to conform to its values and traditions. And there, there are ideologies out there that will lead to harm and devastation and destruction. But as Christians, we must not be conformed. Instead, we are to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. Do you see the contrast there? See, in this world, we're gonna be formed. You know, we are gonna be molded and shaped by something. And according to Paul, it's either gonna be by the world or it's gonna be by God. And whoever that is that you're molded by, it's up to you, you have the choice. But let me encourage you that even in the midst of this fallen and broken world, it is possible to be molded by God. And it is for those who have faith in Jesus Christ who will be molded by him. See, Paul, he actually uses this same word, be transformed, in 2 Corinthians 3.18. And it'll, it'll help us further understand this life of transformation and growth that God wants for us. It says, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree, one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You see, God, he doesn't want you to just change on the outside. He wants to change your heart. He wants to change your entire life. Outward change, it might, it might fool the people around you. You know, you might convince other people you're a Christian or that you like God, you love God, but it won't fool God. To be really transformed, God must be working in you. It must be working in your heart. And we all struggle with this. If you're struggling with this right now, I just encourage you to ask him to transform you, to ask, you, ask him to work in your life. And the means by which he wants you to grow in this is to read his word, 
to read the Bible and to consider what it has to say about your life. And just pray that the Holy Spirit would transform you as you read it. And as we do that, we can better live our lives as a sacrifice to the Lord. And I think that's what the last portion of this text here means. It says that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The fruit of being transformed by the gospel and your renewing your mind daily is that you delight in God's will and you seek to live it out. So do not be frightened by the immense nature of this passage. It seems daunting to look at our, our lives, our sinful lives, and think, how could we live our lives completely for the Lord, to live completely for Jesus? But remember, this is so critical. Remember that you are united to Christ in the gospel. God, he loves you, and he wants to encourage you and to help you grow and to be more like him. We must remember that our lives are connected to Christ and that he fulfilled the ultimate sacrifice that we never could. Once we grab onto him by faith, we will be able to live a life that is pleasing to him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for um, this passage you've given us. Lord, the, the world wants to conform us. It wants to make us only care about ourselves, to give in to our sinful desires, Lord. But you want us to be more like your son, Jesus. You want us to renew our minds daily, to follow you. And that it's a hard thing to do, but if we have faith in you, if we believe in the gospel, we can do it, Lord. You can work your grace in our lives. And I just pray that you would do that for all of us here knowing that we can't do this on our own strength, but only through your grace, Lord, can we live a life that is pleasing to you. So I just pray that you would help us do that this week. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.